Hello, and thank you everyone for joining today's Data Theorem webinar. Did you know CCPA has already begun? Learn how to prepare your data, mobile apps, web apps, and APIs. I'm going to take a few moments to introduce Data Theorem before we get started. We were founded in 2013 and are based in Palo Alto, California, with offices in New York and Paris. Each of our leaders has over 15 years of security industry experience and has published several security research books and led substantial acquisitions. We've also had the privilege to work with a wide variety of the customers you see here to advance their mobile app stack and API security programs. Before I hand it over to our speaker, we will have time for Q&A at the end of this session but feel free to post your questions as we go along and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible at the end of our session. Now introducing Richard Smith, Director at Data Theorem. Thank you, Felicia, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so just gonna recap our agenda. So we're gonna cover how CCPA affects your company, impacts on mobile and modern web app strategies, how to prepare your data, apps, and APIs. Then we'll do a quick recap, and as Felicia mentioned, we'll, we'll definitely save some time for Q&A at the end. So let's get started. We are investigating, as a matter of urgency, the theft of customer data between August 21st and September 5th, 2018, from our website, ba.com, and our mobile app. This is British Airways' public uh, announcement on the data breach that occurred roughly a year ago. And what happened was they, they, they had the theft of customer data on their web app and mobile app. And so that's what we're really gonna focus on here today. And what's important is what the result of this was. British Airways faces a record $230 million fine as a, after website failure compromised the personal details of roughly 500,000 customers. And so what this is telling us is that privacy now has teeth. And uh, something as simple as a mobile and web app security uh, issue over a two-week period led to a $230 million fine. And what this is, is governments are enforcing privacy now by hitting the bottom line for organizations. And so we saw this, and this fine in this particular case is coming from GDPR, as they're now starting to, to hand down those fines. We even saw, uh, I think this week as well, Marriott uh, was, was handed, uh, is, is also being looked at for a very large fine um, in the hundreds of million dollars category. And so the European Union really spearheaded data privacy for, consu um, for consumers and really users in general. And now California, with the California Consumer Privacy Act going into 2020, is leading the charge in the United States on how we handle uh, consumer uh, information. And so the first thing we want to look at is, does the law apply to your company? And it's not a mixture or an and of all these things. It can, it's really an or, um, so just keep in mind, it's, it's not all of these things, it's any one of these things can, can put you within the scope of uh, CCPA. And the first is annual gross revenue of $25 million or more within your organization. You buy, receive, sell, or share personal information of 50,000 or more uh, people, consumers, households, or devices or 50% of your revenue comes from selling consumer personal information. So any one of these three is to put you within the scope of CCPA. On top of that, then it's a matter of, are you collecting consumer or personal data? Are you processing personal information on consumers? And do you do business in California? And it's important to note where all those, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act is starting to lead the charge. There are many states that are now starting to uh, follow suit and are starting to draft up uh, regulation behind California, like New York, New Mexico, Massachusetts, um, and a number of others. So this is, this is, they're really spearheading this trend, and we're gonna continue to see these types of regulations uh, be put into effect. And so a lot of us uh, have probably already started looking at GDPR 
especially if your organization does business within uh, the European Union, you're probably uh, more so aware of uh, the regulations around GDPR. And, I, and that's kind of set the tone on how we're starting to think about privacy here in the US. But now it's, is what I would like to do is kind of compare what we know about GDPR and how we're kind of handling that to how CCPA uh, will affect our organizations and how they're similar and where they differ. And so the, the important thing to look at up front is, is in the name. It's really from, for, for CCPA, the focus is going to be on for-profit organizations um, and how you and how those organizations handle consumer data. Whereas GDPR has had a slightly different approach in that it's looking at privacy a little bit more holistically for uh, for the individual or a, what would they call a data subject, and that it's privacy along both for profit businesses, public bodies, institutions, and non-for-profit organizations are all within the scope of GDPR if they're handling any personal information, whether it be a consumer or just having records on users. Uh, so some, some differences there in the approach. Uh, where they also differ um, fairly, uh, fairly vastly is the reach in which the law has. So CCPA is only going to focus on um, residents of California and specifically consumers with res residents within California, whereas GDPR is any record um, out there if you're doing business or have a presence in the EU, even if that record does not live in the EU or that, that, uh, that data subject. Now, where they're similar is if, if your business is looking at things from aggregate or anonymous data collection or looking at things from that perspective and how you're processing data, they both do uh, basically exclude that type because it's no longer personally identifiable information that compromises the individual's privacy. So that's one area where they're very similar. Um, but another area, I think this is probably the one that's probably most important we've got to look at, because this again is being used as a tool to enforce privacy through fines, is that CCPA is unique in that there is no cap on the fines um, that can be introduced uh, on an organization for violation of the law. Whereas with GDPR, it does have a cap, and it's either $22 million or 4% of annual revenue, depending on which is greater. So obviously in the case of British Airways, that was more along the lines of their annual revenue uh, because they're facing a fine much larger than $22 million. And so one of the things that's important to note is as we're getting prepared for CCPA um, and we're looking toward that January 2020 date, it's actually not enough to just look there. We actually have to look back to January 1st, 2019, because the law, once it does go into effect, is going to look at the last year and how you've handled data and what you've done over that period of time. So we really have to think over the next few months about how what we're doing now to prepare um, for 2020, but also to look back and make sure we, we didn't put ourselves at risk over the over 2019 period. And if you ever, if you, one of the things I recommend is definitely uh, taking a look at caprivacy.org um, because the, there are some new addendums uh, happening to the law as it, as it gets ready for 2020, and a lot of the updates are out there, and uh, I, I recommend staying uh, close to that as we get closer. So what I want to do here, and I think one of the unique elements of CCPA is the fact that its maximum fine can be so dramatic, and it's an area where um, it's going to be a little bit different than what we've kind of prepared ourselves with GDPR. And so this is kind of a, it's, a, it's the most extreme case, but it, it really paints the picture of how easy fines can grow with something like CCPA. And if we take a look at California, it's the most populous state uh, in the United States with 40 million residents. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but the potential maximum fine per violation can be up to $7,500 per uh, each of those residents potentially, if they're all within your consumer scope, which would result in a potential maximum five of $300 billion. So way more than what we even saw with British Airways and GDPR, you can see how this can grow pretty large pretty quickly, even with a small scope of residents um, that is California. And obviously other states are going to be looking to this legislation um, moving forward. So this is going to be one of those things you're probably going to be having to not only look at CA, but in a year or two, three years down the road, you'll see other states doing this on top of that as well. And so let's understand CCPA funds a little bit more. And the first is a uh, unintentional violation. So 
if you compromise or lose or mishandle uh, consumer data uh, per per consumer, the uh, un and it's done in an unintentional way or where it was not a, an intentional violation or knowingly, uh, the fine is $2,500 per violation per consumer if that's compromised. Now, where this gets more dramatic is it's three times that if it's found or determined that the, the violation was intentional. Um, so whether, you know, if you're handling data in a way that, you know, could put you at risk and that was known, you have now subjected yourself to 3x the violation per, uh, per violation. But what I really think is interesting is on top of the fines that can be handed down through the law is it's also opened up the door to civil-based lawsuits that individuals or the consumer can now take on top of that. And typically that is because the framework of the law is one to seven hundred and one hundred to seven hundred and fifty dollars. But it also includes an element for damages if, if the consumer had considerable damages or can, can justify damages and it and it affords that whichever is greater. So Again, on top of fines, we are net, there's a framework that allows the consumer to be able to take those civil lawsuits on top of that. So it does really open up the door uh, to really impact our businesses. So let's talk about how this impacts our mobile and, mobile and web apps. And this is something we really need to look at because if we take a look at the British Airways example, that large fine they're facing was due to how they kind of mishandled the security posture around both their mobile and web apps and didn't realize that it put them at risk um, for a vulnerability that ultimately resulted in um, now where they are today with those fines. And so the first thing you should ask yourself is, should you be concerned? Well, that comes back to, do you collect uh, this type of data, you know, whether through it's your mobile or web apps, are you collecting personal, personally identifiable information? And uh, if anybody's familiar with you know, PII, all these different things make up PII, and it can just be one of these things that can be used to determine, hey, this is uh, some level of PII uh, for a consumer. It doesn't have to be all these things. So are you collecting this type of data? And it can be simple stuff. Email now and, and full name, it doesn't have to be social security number or passport or some of the more um, you know, details that we, we tend to think, oh, we're not collecting that type of data, we're okay. Um, really, any of these now are things you have to think about um, with CCPA going into effect. And so why, why do apps and APIs matter? Well, again, going back to the British Airways example, this was, it was a two-week vulnerability, two vulnerability in web app and a mobile app that led to to compromise the, the data compromise they experienced. And when we think about it, the way in a digital world we are now interacting and working with our consumers is through our web applications, our cloud apps, our mobile apps, and even now with serverless type of applications. This is how we're typically collecting, interacting, and sharing personal and consumer data with our customers and our consumers. And so data really becomes the center of all these things. And then we're typically storing those, that data either in cloud storage or in our own infrastructure. But the way we're connecting and the back end behind all these applications and how they're exchanging data is also those APIs. So we have to look at both the applications and the APIs to make sure at no point are we introducing vulnerabilities or handling our consumer data in a way that puts us at risk uh, for violating CCPA. So the first area I want to talk about as we, as we kind of look at the, the impacts is on the mobile side. And a lot of the times when we look at our mobile application, or, or, or not just the mobile side, but our application side, so both mobile and web. And when we look at our applications, um, a lot of the times we think, okay, we're developing the software ourselves, we know everything that's going into it. But the reality in today's development cycles is developers are leveraging third-party software. And for good reason, it saves them time and it saves them money when they're trying to develop your own applications. And so what developers are doing is they're now introducing uh, SDKs or open source libraries into your own applications. And so it's important to have visibility and understand, hey, do our applications contain this third party software? And the reason for that is, is once these applications are compiled or, or taken, you know, especially in the mobile side, this third-party software now has access to the information across the app and is treated like native code 
Um, and we need to be mindful of the type of data um, that it can collect from our application at that point. And that's really our next question. Do we know uh, what type of personal information or even permissions um, these third party, this third party software we're introducing into our application is collecting and potentially sending back to its own APIs? And then it becomes a matter of asking ourselves the question, what, is, what level of risk are we willing to introduce for things like uh, some of these new regulations for the convenience of you know, easy to use software development kits and things like that for developers, right? We have to start thinking about um, what, what's happening in that side of our applications. And then still along the sides of our, the lines of our applications, we have to start thinking about security checks in our software development lifecycle. And, you know, the first thing I would ask is, do you have a security model in place for your application development, right? And I think that the, the place you have to start there is thinking about, okay, how are we developing software and how are we going to build checks for that? And when we start to think about the checks that we want to introduce, not only just looking for, you know, day-to-day -day vulnerabilities or, or things like that, we also have to introduce and think about, do we have checks that look for things that might put us at risk for regulatory compliance or new laws such as CCPA where we're collecting potentially user data, usernames and passwords, and are we doing something where we're storing it you know, in plain text that, that we're, we're not even checking for and we don't even know is occurring uh, in our application? And then are these checks point in time or continuous? And I think this is going to be really important as we talk about how to prepare is we really have to look at this and understand, okay, are we doing enough in this space and are we doing it in a way that keeps up with how we're developing our applications? Now, the other front we talked about, and I think this is uh, probably an area that can be even more uh, at risk for large data breaches, which ultimately can lead to those really big headlines that we see, is our APIs. And the one thing we never want to do is be in a position where we have a leaky API that is exposing uh, personal uh, consumer uh, data. And so one of the first questions I like to ask is, well, how many APIs do your apps connect to, right? Do we know all the, the APIs that our mobile and our web and our, S, our single page applications are connecting to? And once we understand that, do we understand the type of data that is being exchanged across those APIs? Are they collecting information on our customers, our consumers, and then what type and, and handling that? Is it usernames and logins and so forth? And it's good to understand which each of those APIs do, because when you identify the ones that are going to handle consumer data, you need to now think about the security posture around that. And that leads into, into my third question is, are your APIs secure, right? Do you have a security policy in place that looks at all the different tenants that are important when we look at API security? And then the fourth question is really, how frequently are your APIs being updated? And this is really important because with modern day software development and how the cloud has made things very easy for developers to create new APIs, it's always important to understand how those APIs are evolving and how your security posture around them needs to change. And so lastly, when I get into this last question, if you kind of looked at any of these four and said, hey, you know, no, I don't necessarily know this, or I might not be there with this one, or I'm not aware, we don't have a policy here, then it's probably time to start thinking about, okay, do we have an API security program in place that's designed to address all these questions and make sure that we don't expose ourselves to leaky APIs that lead to headlines? So how to prepare. So the first thing, we'll, we'll go back to the, um, the application side, is it's, all, it's, it's really important that we start automating security checks in our software development. So whether your organization is using more modern techniques like Agile or DevOps, um, which you know, have really have uh, automation, especially in the DevOps side, is really baked into that lifecycle um, to be able to get software out there faster, sooner, and quicker to market. Um, we have to start thinking about the checks from a security perspective that we want to introduce into those models. And when it comes to third-party software, we need to think of it. Uh, are we scanning both our native and our third-party code, uh, third code dynamically? Are we identifying issues with third-party code at runtime? So are we actually 
understanding how that third-party software we're putting into our applications behaves when it's executed. And is it doing things like making connections places that we're not aware of? And then are we staying current with the latest no, uh, known vulnerabilities? And this is important with any security checks that you're going to automate in your platform is making sure that they're current. And even more so when you're dealing with third-party software, because you could have newer versions of that third-party code, but if your check is for three versions old, you may not find something that has been introduced by a developer. And so it's important to know you're up to date with those latest vulnerabilities and that you're using the tools that are out there that can help you stay current. And then understanding what the third-party API connections uh, are occurring within those applications and the permissions that it's, um, it's requesting. Because that third-party software can ask for things like contacts and so forth, and we want to know what they're doing so that we, and, and we can automate those types of checks into our um, software development. Now, as we really kind of focus more on the compliance, again, these are kind of just general as well, um, but are we, do we have checks in place that are looking for remotely exploitable data vulnerabilities? And this is important because, you know, um, if, if something can be remotely uh, vulnerable, we need to think about that up front because that vulnerability will be the breach in which we see these large records, uh, data records loss. We need to implement checks for regulations. So understand if there's checks that, if, if we're doing things within our applications, um, that would put us at risk for violation and how we're handling data. We need to make sure that we have visibility and have things in place to look for that. And then lastly, we need to perform static and dynamic analysis on a continuous basis for each release cycle. Um, it's no longer enough to just look at the one-time audit. We have to think beyond that because you may pass an audit today, but if tomorrow you have a breach and that makes headlines, you're going to have uh, you're going to be in violation of the law and, and be at risk for, uh, for those penalties. And then on the API front, we have two different categories that we really want to look at. The first is, do we have visibility into our APIs? Do we know all the APIs in all of our cloud environments, our gateways, our mobile apps, our web apps, our SPAs, and our service app, uh, serverless apps that are out there? Do we know the APIs that are there that are t uh, collecting or transmitting data? And then once we have that visibility, do we know what our security policy is around those APIs and are we doing something to enforce that around authentication, authorization, encryption, availability, storage access, and database access? And making sure that all those checks are in place and continuously monitoring our APIs. And so through automation, we can automate compliance reporting. And this goes back to what I was mentioning, right? We want, we want to be able to not just have a point in time pass the audit for, you know, CCPA compliance check, right? We need to automate our security checks so we can do real-time reporting on compliance and so that we're, we're never in the dark if something's changed in our software development or our APIs that's ultimately going to lead to a breach because those headlines will come either way, whether you pass the audit or not, and the fines will follow that. And so we've got to move away from the manual auditing process, and we've got to you know, move to automation, which helps us scale with modern software development. And the reason is, is what was secure yesterday may not be today. And so Data Theorem, um, as, as you can imagine, has a automated analyzer engine uh, that helps us discover and conduct continuous security assessments and compliance reporting. We'll talk a little bit more in a minute uh, about how you can check that out. Um, but in conclusion, Governments are enforcing data privacy by hitting the bottom line. Mobile apps, web apps, and API security is critical, and automate security checks for real-time compliance reporting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Richard. With our remaining time, I'd like to get a couple of our audience questions. I've got a couple here, um, starting with the first one. I don't understand what you mean by the CCPA has already begun. Can you be more specific about that? Yeah, so um, when the legislation, uh, so the legislation uh, for CCPA will go into effect on January 1, 2020. Uh, but as part of the legislation, it is going to look one year in reverse as to how you've been handling uh, consumer data. So whereas, whereas we, we kind of are all targeting this 2020 January 1st date, the reality is, 
we need to think about how we've been handling consumer data since January 1, 2019. Um, so as we're starting to prepare now, it's not only looking to the future, but looking back in that one year in arrear uh, to make sure that we, we understand what we're putting in place, can see, and make sure that we're not introducing issues or risk. Great. Another question is, considering the latest breaches like Capital One this week, how would the CCPA apply specifically in that case? Yeah, it's a good one. So uh, the Capital One breaches made some, some big headlines, in this, uh, especially around the security community this week. Um, and if I look at that one, right, I think it was 100 million uh, consumer records were, were lost, which was through, I think, credit card applications and so forth. Um, so 100 million records, which is a, is a substantial amount, I think 6 million more in Canada. Um, and of those 100 million, I believe 120 uh, were social security numbers of consumers that were lost, and I think another 80 were bank, 80,000 were bank accounts um, for, for Capital One consumers. And so when we look at that size numbers, you know, obviously knowing Capital One does business across the entire United States, whatever percentage of that 100 million uh, were consumers or residents of California, all of them would be uh, liable for up to that maximum fine of 7500 7, per each of those consumer uh, violations that occurred um, for those residents of California. So, the, you know, if, if that were to be taken a look at for this year, right, you, you would see probably a pretty substantial fine that uh, Capital One would be looking at from CCPA for how that data was, uh, was lost or mishandled. Okay, thank you. We're at the end of our time, so feel free to continue the conversation with us on how you can prepare for CCPA before January 1st, as well as other upcoming legislation. We invite you to sign up for a demo to start analyzing your program. Thank you very much. Thank you.